That's how he created um, as a rapper around the scene. Um, you know, this, and then he released it with the Apache 2.0 uh, licensing. Um, and uh, this was very fast adopted by the community, and they started using different uh, use cases. Um, so although it was started with a text search, people said, okay, what, where do I need to, you know, search the large amounts of texts, and that will be log files. You know, and then it became log analytics, and Elastic said, okay, well, people are using us for log analytics. Then, um, you know, what can we do to help them out, you know, grab some data, report on, on that, and, you know, the product started evolving from there. And we got joined by two other products in the community, Logstash and Kibana. Logstash for the ingestion process, and Kibana for the presentation and, uh, and general UI. And it kept evolving. Um, this slide actually shows a little bit that evolution and how it went from just the core product in 2010 um, into what it is today, which is a full stack that goes all the way from the, the basic storage. You will still um, contribute to, you know, to even to the Lucene development. We're one of the biggest contributors to the Lucene project. Um, all the way up to the stack to actually have a fully deployed or fully developed applications or application stacks. So what is observability? Um, one of the things, um, as I was saying, people started putting, you know, log files in, into Elasticsearch and that created, um, you know, the, the logging application and, you know, you can do run statistics. How many messages of this type do I have? How many you know, if you're analyzing a web server log is how many 404s I get, how many 500s I get, how many, um, and, and then do uh, monitoring based on that. And then people said, what about, you know, getting the metrics into a JSON document and then pushing those metrics into Elastic and off they went and did that. Um, so now you can correlate the metrics and the log information um, <laughs> as, as we will see, you know, as you go into the dashboards, <clears throat> now you can uh, correlate what is an event that is happening on your system with, you know, what is coming from the logs or vice versa. Um, <coughs> and lately, about a you know, year, year and a half ago, is when uh, we acquired a company uh, that does uh, APM. So basically you start feeding application logs and information that comes from the, uh, from the stack, from the system stack, and now you have tracing and so you can uh, trace all these events and all these uh, things happening on your system all the way to the source code. Um, you, and uh, between the three of them, metrics, logging, and tracing, is what we call the three pillars of observability. Uh, and this is the new buzzword um, coming from the Bay Area. Uh, and observability is I want a 360 view of my system. Um, you know, how do I achieve that? And a single pane of glass. And you're going to see that. Uh, for some of these applications, there's uh, other competitors that do that. Um, but, uh, you know, what we think we do best is putting everything behind the same, uh, on the same system in a single place where you can uh, see it and uh, slice it and dice it from each one of these points of view. Um, and this is what we call the, you know, the observability stack. And uh, in this talk is a little bit on how we get there. Um, Hopefully, uh, as I said, there's plenty of slides. Some of them, I'm going to rush through them, uh, but I left them in the presentation. So when you see it offline, you still have the complete text and maybe, you know, entice you to, to explore on your own. Um, one of the things um, that we do at Elastic is these are the three things we value. So we're not an assets data store. Um, what we value is scale, you know, something that it's easy to go from a single node and then test machine, um, evolve it into, you know, a full scale test and evolve that into, you know, devolve it into production. And as it goes into production, then what is the next step, you know, production at scale? Um, and we're going to see that, uh, or, you know, one of the things you're going to experience is that it's very simple to do that with Elastic. Um, speed is the other thing. Um, you want the results when you're doing, um, you know, whether it is a search or you're doing some analytics uh, on your system, on what's going on in your systems, you want the results to be right away. You want them at the tip of your fingers um, so you can react and you can uh, take action uh, at that particular time, um, you know, as fast as possible. 
Um, and the next thing is you get the results fast, you get them at scale. Uh, the next thing you want is actually to be relevant results. Um, so an empty result set is something that is of no use. So um, Elasticsearch, um, if you have any experience, you'd see that the results all have a score associated with them. And the result set um, is always sorted by that score. So the more relevant results will be at the top of the list of the result set. Um, and then you can operate from there. So what makes Elastic unique then in that sense? Um, first of all is, as I was saying, uh, starting at scale. Uh, you know, launching a node uh, on your machine is very simple. You download a tarball, you expand the tarball, you uh, execute the binaries associated with that, and off you go. You have Elasticsearch running on your local machine and local host. Um, you do that with Kibana in the same way. It will find the Elasticsearch node running on your machine, um, and, uh, and, or, and it's running. And the same thing that is running on a single node, then you can set it up on, uh, on the cloud, whether it is on an EC2 instance, on a compute instance, in whatever cloud you choose, or on your own hardware, or on a virtual machine, and it behaves exactly in the same way. Um, if you want to expand you know, into multiple nodes because you need uh, the high availability or you need to scale, then you just add another node, it will discover um, the, other, the existing nodes um, on the network and it will start coordinating with them you know, how to distribute the load between them. Um, and you can grow all the way to you know, hundreds of nodes. We have, you know, our biggest customers have hundreds of nodes running on their networks and you know, multi processing terabytes of data uh, per day or you know, even petabytes of data per, per day. And the same way you operate on a single node is exactly the same way you operate um, uh, on a huge scale. Um, of course, backups and things like that need other considerations, but that's the idea. Um, uh, again, as I was saying, as, as the data was expanding, what happened is, you know, uh, Elastic started implementing data um, with different indices and representing the data for the different search cases in different ways. So as the data is ingested, that's when it gets indexed, and that's how we get the speed at scale. Um, so all the work is being done on the ingestion time. So when the data is in Elastic, you have that instant retrieval uh, time, no matter what kind of data are you, there, uh, are you using. Um, and it has different indices for the different use cases. So if you're doing just a regular search, um, you know, for that search box on your website, it's definitely going to use um, the, the inverted text. Uh, but if you're using numerical data and you have to search on numbers or ranges and things like that, um, depending on what you're trying to do, whether it's aggregations or just numbers, it's going to use either the BKD indices or the columnar store indices. Um, simply, you know, whatever is best for, for your particular use. Um, so this is the stack. This is how it looks like. These are the components. Elasticsearch, as I was saying, is the engine um, that does uh, most of the work uh, behind the scenes. Uh, it's the wrapper around Lucene. Um, Lucene does the inverted index and, and the text search uh, and a bunch of other tasks. Um, all, the, all the rest is done by the other components inside Elasticsearch. Um, on the bottom side of the stack is where we have the log stash and beats. Um, log stash was the traditional way of ingesting the data. Um, that's where the, uh, the L and the ELK stack comes from. Um, now it's more of a transformation or ETL tool. Um, so basically the data that the beat the agents um, cannot process or it's not enough uh, enrichment or don't do enough processing, you run them through Logstash. Uh, and Logstash can do a bunch of other things on top of, of that data. Um, for example, a very common um, thing is um, you know, combine the data from other data sources. So for security, for example, um, you can uh, grab the malware IP addresses coming uh, from some services that publish those IP addresses and then as you ingest logs from your website you can uh, tag those IP addresses if they already belong to that uh, list of malware. Um, so you have them identified as you ingest. Uh, and Kibana 
evolve from a reporting tool and a GUI tool into also a management tool. And we're, you know, time allowing, um, we're going to see um, if we can see some examples of that management. So how does the ingestion happen? Uh, the ingestion happens uh, mostly through the bead agents. The bead agents are very thin agents that you install at the endpoints. Uh, they're written in Go, um, so there's no dependencies. They're fully contained, um, very lightweight, and, um, and they, they can uh, uh, ingest all kinds of data. And some of the data, uh, for example, at NetFlow, uh, data that comes from your devices at the edge of the network uh, would be ingested using Logstash. Um, you know, we have plenty of modules. Um, again, Logstash is the ETL tool and it, it can do um, all kinds of transformations. Um, it runs on its own machine. Uh, it needs Java, so it's a little bit more heavyweight um, than the beads, the, the bead agents. Um, um, this is a little bit more information on the bead agents. Um, we have um, seven bead agents developed by ourselves. Um, file bead, what it does is a, it a, looks, um, it absorb, it ingests the data that are uh, contained on log files, uh, typically. Uh, metric bead is um, an agent that uh, will gather information uh, from the systems, uh, whether it is uh, from the core system or the different modules and services running on the systems and uh, ship it all to Elasticsearch. Packet bead is the same thing or similar um, uh, to uh, what TCP dump and Wireshark would do, you know, captures information on the network of a system and handle, you know, sends that information back to Elasticsearch. This is great to analyzing network traffic, who's communicating with whom, uh, who, um, what kind of information is being sent. Um, Winlog bead, uh, same as file bead in, syst in uh, Windows systems. Um, you don't have log files, you have event events that are stored into the system, when look bead basically taps into that information. Uh, heartbeat is, um, we have uh, built some functionality around that uh, in our latest releases. Uh, basically, it's a way to monitor whether a service is up, and you can monitor that from anywhere on the network. So you can monitor whether your website is accessible, uh, you know, what are the delays, what are the latency, and you can do that from your own network or from a remote location um, and uh, act upon that. Uh, maybe when you're running an e-commerce system, what you want to make sure is not only that the system is up, but also that the response times are, you know, are fast and are within an SLA uh, because you don't want people, you know, maybe traditional systems um, might tell you that the system is down or up but it might not tell you that it's, it's slow and uh, customers are gonna walk away if the system is slow, even though your system is gonna you know, tell you that the system is up and running. Audit beat, uh, similar to file beat in a way, uh, but what it does is it goes into the kernel of the system um, to uh, gather all the audit events. And function beat, this is new, this is, comes with the cloud technology. Uh, basically, uh, it gets the information from CloudWatch and for the uh, cloud infrastructure um, straight into, um, into Elasticsearch as well. Uh, in this case, uh, you have to keep in mind that when you have traditional systems, you spin up a machine, you spin up a, um, a virtual machine, um, and you're up and running and you can monitor. But uh, containers are ephemeral. Um, so maybe you have uh, functions that, you know, or services, microservices that come up um, on and off, you know, um, continuously and it's very difficult then, you know, to see what is going on because um, basically, you know, now they're there, then they're not. Uh, with uh, function beat, you're able to capture all those elements as they happen. Um, it's a Lambda function in AWS or similar, it will be implemented in a similar way on Google Cloud and Azure um, and allows you to monitor then these cloud events. So this is how the architecture looks like. Um, the basic architecture, uh, you're gonna have beat running on, on the edges of the system, gathering all the data. Uh, the data can be um, you know, fed directly into Elasticsearch or go through Logstash for enrichment. Logstash is then also capable of gathering 
additional data from other systems, whether it is our NARDBMS, um, you know, uh, network devices and things like that as well. Um, all goes into Elasticsearch and not everything is exploited and managed uh, through Kibana. So this is how the, the chain looks like. Um, now, if we go into Beats, uh, Beat have modules and we're going to see a little bit more detail on how this works. Which, with, what that means is when you run Beats and when you run them for the first time, it will create the dashboards for yourself. But not only that, um, if you enable a, a certain module, it will understand and um, you know, gather information for that subsystem. And there is a, you know, dozens of modules already predefined. So it understands MySQL, Postgres, it understands Nginx, Apache, um, it understands um, you know, many of the uh, NoSQL storage systems as well. Um, if you want to see you know, a sleuth of uh, a nice group of, um, of how these beats look like or how these dashboards look like, um, this uh, URL, don't visit them, you know, hundreds of you, you know, at the same time, you may crash it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, actually, uh, for, for an audience this big, actually, it should work just fine, but uh, it, it goes and shows a lot of these dashboards and a lot of the features that uh, I may not have time to cover in detail. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is uh, starting on version 7.0, we're releasing what we call Elastic Common Schema. What this means is the attributes from the different systems. We have a uniformity ac across the names and the attributes of the fields. So it doesn't matter if the data comes from a big five uh, router on the edge or a firewall or a Juniper Networks uh, network device or coming from your SQL server uh, or your cloud server or your web server. You know, when you talk about destination IP address or host name, um, the attribute for that particular field is going to be the same across all indices. Uh, what that does is it allows you to cross-check the information and make sure that you know it's uniform across systems. When so, when you run queries and dashboards, um, everything is consistent. Um, so, for logs and metrics, collecting met me uh, metrics is. Uh, collecting metrics, um, you know, this is uh, basically a, a little bit of an example of um, how the data looks like, the original data. As I was saying, when you run the, me the metric beats uh, or any of the beat uh, agents for the first time, it will create these dashboards for you. Um, so you have a zero to running something useful uh, in, uh, in no time, in, in 15 minutes. Um, or even less, depending on the volume of your systems. Um, and in some cases, it will also create uh, the machine learning jobs for your alerting system, and it will create the alerts, the default alerts as well. Um, these are the infrastructure metric beats and the modules that it supports. Um, these are most of them. Uh, there, are, there are many more, and we have new ones coming up at all, uh, you know, at all times. Um, this is a little bit more uh, of the infrastructure um, as well. Um, this is a, an infrastructure view, uh, you know, how everything is, is viewed together. Basically, um, as you have containers coming on and off, as I was saying, locating them on dashboards becomes very difficult because, you know, now they're there, <coughs> now they're not and then they come back up again. So we have implemented on the latest versions this infrastructure view, which is a tile uh, interface where you can see your systems up and running, and if they, they're color-coded, so if they're gray, um, that means they're in normal state. If they're um, in, in that um, teal color, that means they might be under stress, and if they're red, it means something is going wrong. And you can uh, click on that tile and go straight into the metrics for that particular um, system right away. Uh, collecting logs is not much different as, again, um, you know, the metrics, uh, the file beat agent uh, creates dashboards for you, so some counters, um, some graphic representation of what's going on. Um, it might create some maps as well, for example, with geographical, it would get the GOIP information from the IP address and map them to a, um, into a, an actual map um, that will tell you, you know, where the traffic is coming from uh, geographically. 
um, and you can see if you have um, you know a normal time uh, type of traffic coming from a single location. Again, there is plenty of modules that are supported. Um, also, the logs, there is an inf a new uh, user interface in Kibana that allows you to see the logs streaming as they go by. Um, this is like a tail-f um, interface for all your logs. Uh, but also, one of the things you can do is you still have Elasticsearch underneath it. So you can filter those logs <coughs> with using just the, the messaging. So as you see the logs flowing live in your screen, uh, you can say, okay, show me all the ones that belong um, to a certain region or to a certain range of IP addresses uh, or have a certain return code or have, you know, and, and you can um, basically focus very fast into the information you're interested as it is coming through to your screen. Um, uh, if you try to do that in the command line and at some point, um, you know, many years ago, uh, when I was a DBA, um, we had to write, you know, very complex one-liners and, you know, Linux pipes to get all this up and running. So that's beta? That's not out yet? Or um, leading edge? It, it is, I think it's GA on version 7.0, which is the latest. Um, alerting um, in... Um, this is probably um, as far as we can go with the slide where, although there's been plenty of more slides. Um, it has, you know, the traditional alerting systems by threshold, um, and this will, you know, give you all the, um, the, the typical alert systems that you will find in something like Nagios. Uh, the great advantage in this case is since you have everything running on the same place, is that anything that you can run or any value that you can get from an Elasticsearch query is a valid way, um, you know, to get that alert. Um, so that gives you a flexibility that it's very rare uh, on many other systems. Um, so for example, in this case is, you know, if you have uh, more than a certain number of login attempts on a given machine uh, on a given time uh, timeline. So if someone is trying to do a brute force attack, um, you can alert right away. However, the really important thing is um, the machine learning, you know, uh, and again, alerts, um, one of the things I wanted to mention is it has, you can, um, you can derive actions. So the alert not only sends you the message uh, or sends the message to uh, on email or uh, an email to SMS gateway uh, or Slack, um, you can through the API, not through the graphical u user interface, but through the API, you can actually add webhooks. So you can trigger certain actions, um, you know, from the alert itself. Uh, product, sorry. I think that threshold alerts might be part of basic. Okay. So it's not open source, which means uh, cloud providers that don't have a relationship with us don't have the product, but if we offer it um, you know, from our cloud service or our downloads as part of the basic license. Machine learning, it is a commercial licensed product, but um, it is a feature worth uh, looking into. Um, if you're in a commercial deployment, um, you know, what is machine learning? It's a subset of, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence group. Uh, I've been looking into artificial intelligence for more decades um, than I want to admit. Um, otherwise, you'll realize how old I am. And, uh, and it has always been uh, a shifting target. So machine learning is, you know, fuzziness within that fuzziness. Um, what we do is we don't claim that you need your, you know, your data uh, experts, you know, looking into it and writing algorithms. Um, our developers have written some alg algorithms specifically targeted to anomaly detection. Um, so what that means is you have a time series data, whether it's coming from logs or metrics, comes into Elasticsearch, the machine learning algorithms sift through that data and say, okay, this data looks out of range, um, you know, uh, here's an alert, you know, look into it, and it gives you a score. Um, and basically, is you don't know what you don't know. Um, it, it was one of the applications is sometimes you have these time series, um, you never seen anything anomalous, 
So you don't really know um, when a value is out of range or shouldn't be there. Um, at the same time, sometimes you have data that is seasonal. Um, it's not the same amount of traffic you have on an e-commerce website uh, during normal waking hours as opposed to that during the night. Um, so maybe a value that it's abnormal uh, during the night, um, it's completely normal during the day. How do we alert on that? How you detect that? A normal threshold can, can do that. And this is how it looks like. Um, so this is a time series uh, data that it's uh, you know, very seasonal during the day. Um, and, uh, and the gray area is what the algorithms determine as being the normal values for that uh, particular data on that time range. And the little you know, color-coded dots are the anomalies. So this is where I'm going to interrupt my presentation, although there's plenty to go. And let's see if I can go into my system. So as I was saying, this is my own desktop running at home. Um, and what it uses the most is the browser and, uh, and a free open source game. So nothing exciting to see here. Uh, and it runs a few other processes in the background. Um, and that's how I get all these uh, system load parameters. Um, all these dashboards, all these dials, uh, it's all defined uh, on metric beats by default. Um, so I didn't have to do really anything here. Uh, but what I want to do here is let's go uh, here. Since I'm an employee and running this on the cloud, uh, on our cloud, um, I can do um, I can create a, a machine learning job. Um, and what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to check the index. Uh, it's metric beat. Uh, these are the type of uh, analysis it can do. Um, if I had more than one machine being uh, monitored, I would go with multi-metric. Um, that means that this rule that I'm going to apply, uh, that I'm going to create, it applies to all the um, all the machines uh, on my set of machines. Uh, but since I have a single one, let's go with single metric. Um, and it says a new job for, for index pattern. So select an aggregation. And here I select you know, what I'm trying to look for. And I'm going to try to look for the mean value of a certain metric. Um, then I select the field. Um, I know what the fields are, but I can go through the drop down list. But System, CPU, <coughs> user percentage. Um, the bucket span, uh, spans is, you know, the amount of time that it would do the analysis. The buckets, it's going to divide. It's going to compare bucket to bucket. Um, and I'm going to say use the full metric data. Uh, there it shows the data that has been gathered. Once I click here, um, oh, I need to do the job ID. Uh, let's call it Linux Fest Northwest. I'm not going to do much more, but uh, in the advanced configuration is where I can set up, um, you know, actions and watch and alarms and things like that. Um, I can do a validate the job. It says everything is okay. Close. Create the job. And now it's looking through the data, doing its averages and calculations, and saying, OK, these are normal values. These are abnormal values. Um, you know, and this is what's going on. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore the, this gap here, because that's data that hasn't been gathered. Um, but the, it has been, the job has been created. So now I can go and view the results. Um, this will take me to the single metric viewer. And I have a slide rule here. And I can see the values, you know, that have been, they're abnormal. And if I go down here, I can see for the more, most abnormal value is when it happened. You know, this happened on April 11th. Um, you know, what is the uh, typical value expected at that point in time, you know, what is the actual value that it got. Um, 
and should have a scoring there. It has, well, it has the scoring, um, the, the actual typical score, and it's 30% higher than normal. Um, and then I could have a link to a certain dashboard here, uh, and that would have sent me to the dashboard, um, you know, with the filter applied for that particular span in time. And then I can do the analysis to see why this was an atypical value. Um, so I'm going to go th very quickly through um, a few more slides. Um, just for completeness, um, this goes, uh, and this is actually to mention APM and see how it looks like. Um, basically what it does is it adds um, agents uh, in the application, whether they're language agents. These are the uh, language agents we support now. Um, actually .NET, uh, should have, this should have been updated with .NET. Um, and it also does real user monitoring, so basically monitoring the activity on the website, uh, on the browser, I'm sorry. Um, so, and then it records everything on Elasticsearch. So in this case, what it does is it gives you all the information, uh, all the way from the metrics and the logs, um, you know, and the services, and plus the activity uh, on the code. And in this case, um, and uh, it, it shows here, down here in the screen, um, the actual transactions that happen in the application, and um, you know, and you can then correlate the impact it had on performance. So you can easily determine. Um, here you have a stack view uh, on how this looks like, um, and again, I can do a demo on the booth uh, with a little bit more detail. Um, but you can determine exactly where the time is spent. So. Um, one of the things when I was a DBA was always uh, the developers coming and saying, oh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a database fault. And uh, then it would say, someone, you know, DBA would say, well, no, it's the hardware fault. And the system administrators say, no, it's the application fault. You know, this actually settles that once and for all because you see everything in the same place. And then you can say, oh, it's this particular piece of code and this particular position in the stack where the time is being spent. And then you can determine whether it is one or the other. Um, basically, how the architecture looks like, this is a simplified diagram that we saw before. Uh, and uh, so that adds an APM server and APM agents. Uh, the APM agents and the APM server are fully open source, so they're covered within the basic license, uh, which basically means you're free to uh, download, install it, and use it right away. Um, machine learning is not, it has to go through subscription or, you know, through cloud, uh, but uh, certainly um, APM is actually something that it's uh, free, free as in beer. So I'm going to leave it here. Um, any questions? About uh, your flow in inputs for like NetFlow, do you accept other types of flows like S flows or J flows and not just NetFlow? Um, the question is, you know, what other flows uh, we support? Um, I would have to see the list of modules in Logstash. NetFlow is one of the Logstash modules. Um, as some of these standards, actually, as, as we discover the community, you know, being industry standards, that gets moved on to um, one of the beat agents. Um, and then, you know, we leave Logstash to enrich some other things. Uh, but that would have to be part of the uh, we would have to see the, the Logstash agents, whether they support those other standards as well. I think, the, oh, actually, we still have like five more minutes. So let me go. Now what you showed us with like machine learning, is that built in? That everything. Um, or is this part of your no. Elastic services? Uh, no, everything is built within the Elk stack. Okay. One of the changes that happened over the last year or so is um, 
before that, when you had all these additional packages, you had to install them, you know, once you acquire them or had the licensing. Right now, when you install the Elk stack, you get absolutely everything. You just have to enable it or not. So if you try to use, if you install it on your machine, you know, to run uh, standalone, uh, or you go to the cloud, you can enable a test, you know, license for 30 days or for 14 days, depending on where you do it. And you get the, to try it and, you know, run it on your own. Mm -hmm. um, so there is ways to try it, uh, but, um, but it, everything is installed. You don't have to install absolutely anything new or, you know, separate uh, at all. When you download, you download absolutely everything. When you download it from our repositories, so you're not going to get this on Elastic, uh, on Elastic on AWS. Well, I didn't show it in dashboards because I, I don't have it there, but, um, but you can have dashboards that show the processes that are running at any given time. Okay. Point in time. You can have, I could have had uh, the syslog, if I had the file be running, and I could have had the syslog running at the same time. And, and then, you know, I can get a dashboard that you know, shows um, the CPU utilization, the processes that are running, and the syslog. And then when I, I can put a link on the alert, on the machine learning job, I can put a link on the alert that takes me to that dashboard. And when it takes me to that dashboard, it takes me with all the time filters and the host name filters and everything in place. So I'm looking at a single dashboard that pertains to a particular point. Uh, specific thread that was on the machine learning um, if I had a PM running and if this was a production system, yes. Okay. Um, what it will show you is actually histograms of the threads that were running because distributed tracing, you have many things running at the same time. Uh, but it will have, you know, for it, for it, and then you would have anomalies. That's one of the things I was trying to get to onto the demo of the site for the APM data and actually show a couple of other things to get you started. Um, but, uh, but yes, you can track it down all the way to the thread, and within the thread to a particular span where the time is spent, and then you can you know, decide whether that was a, an infrastructure issue, code issue, database issue, whatever it was. And you also said that it looked like a virtualization of the USB sphere. Sorry? B sphere for virtualization. Yeah. Uh, does it run in Hyper-B? Um, it, uh, it actually monitors Hyper-B, but, oh, okay. right, but no, no. We, uh, uh, all of these processes, we, you can run them out of containers or whatever you choose. So speaking of containers, uh, the install story for it, do you have like an official Docker image? Or yeah, there is a, a yes, a, both. both. Uh, there is an official Docker image, and there are official hand charts. And we're coming with Ansible scripts as well. You know, whatever the user, you know, if we see the community uh, or our customers using some technology, we have been, uh, you know, part of my language, but uh, containers and persistent storage systems, whether it is a database or Elasticsearch and things like that, it's a bitch. Yes. <laughs> so we have uh, we have been uh, slow in adopting any particular technology because of that. Uh, because there is, even today, there is no set standard. You know, there are some preferences, there, but it's not set standard, yeah. Speaking of uh, persistent storage, do you guys have guidelines on like uh, how to project storage? Oh, you mean with like storage that? for Elasticsearch? Yeah. Um, we recommend attached storage SSDs for hot data. One of the things I didn't show is there is index life management. Um, you know, as you can imagine, these indices, if you have a big infrastructure, can start growing really fast. So what do you do? And one of the things you do is, instead of deploying everything on, on you know, expensive machines, um, these are usually high performance, high I.O. machines, 
running with attached SSD storage um, is to move the old data if you need to persist the data or keep the data uh, for long enough you move it to um, slower storage and then you move it to machines with a, a hard drives, rotating disks. And there is a feature in Kibana that's called Index Life Management. And what it does is automatically grabs the indices that are all, or the data that it's older than, you know, a specified time period, and moves them to these other machines. Um, it's usually easier to show in the cloud because in the cloud we provide the hot warm architecture by default. Otherwise, you have to set it up all yourself and you have to pack the nodes to be hot or <coughs> Right, the policy zero. Yes? Uh, is there a requirement for a uh, deploying the beach to hundreds of existing nodes uh, and then uh, configure them to get a uh, the LK stack? Uh, do you try to have like, a recommended way of doing that? Or is it do you let people put together their own scripts as for well? um, For the initial installation, People have, you know, their own scripts. The installation is pretty straightforward. You know, you would have to, um, because basically you run the command line once with a setup parameter during the installation, and that creates all the dashboards and everything. Um, and then you just run it to <coughs> enable certain modules. Um, but then you would have to write the configure, or you write the configuration file on with your own configuration management system. Once the system <coughs> is um, once it is configured and set up, you can manage them all from, from Kibana. Uh, and Kibana has a beats management system, which is new, it's one of the latest releases, that we added that, uh, and I believe that's part of a basic license, which means it's free. Um, but, uh, you know, I would have to confirm, well, there's a web page in our system that will tell you whether it's free within the basic license or not. It's free. It's well, thank you, Mark. It's free. Uh, and that would allow you to centrally manage all the B agents um, that are part of your infrastructure. So you can have thousands of them running out there. Uh, and you can tag them, you know, differently. And so you can set up configuration based on the tag lines or you know, how they're characterized. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, we're running, we're running out of time. <laughs>